Um, so hi, I'm Jarrett, like David said. Let me, let me adjust the mic. Is that better? Cool. All right, so yeah, as uh, David said, I'm Jarrett. I work at MIT. Um, I worked at CSAIL for a while, uh, and now I'm working in the Operations Research Center. Um, so most of my work revolves around automatic differentiation. Um, and I was just curious who was actually at last year's talk on AD. Yeah, Christopher, we have some people. Okay, cool. Um, did anybody? Great. Well, I'll talk about some locality later in my talk, so this is relevant anyway, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, did anybody see it online? Uh, th so, the reason why I ask uh, is because I am assuming a little bit of forward mode knowledge uh, in this talk, and I was going to talk, um, talk a bit about mixed mode AD, so reverse and forward mode um, optimal methods for accumulating derivatives. Um, but I'm going to be a little bit light on the forward mode um, just due to time constraints and because I'm pretty excited about a uh, new execution tracer uh, that I've implemented um, that I'm hoping will kind of revolutionize AD anyway, so it's kind of the future, so I'd rather just talk about that. Um, so last year, um, when I was talking about forward diff, I generally just explained forward mode AD using dual numbers. Um, I also uh, described how forward diff implements multidimensional dual numbers, which are essentially dual numbers which can track multiple uh, partial derivatives at once. Uh, I emphasized that those dual numbers were heavily stack allocated and aggressively inlined. Um, and so I kind of said at the end of my talk um, that this should make them amenable to SIMD vectorization. Uh, but at the time, we weren't really uh, seeing Julia's compiler emit um, code that LLVM's SLP vectorizer was able to work with easily. And I'm happy to say that since then, um, it actually has become a reality that uh, SIMD vectorization is working with dual numbers. Um, and you can try it out yourself if you just run Julia with O3 um, and look at code LLVM. You can check to see if there are vector instructions in there. Or if your code just speeds up by like three times, that's probably SIMD vectorization. Um, additionally, I talked uh, at the end of my talk last year about um, perturbation confusion, which is this weird kind of bug that can happen if dual numbers from two different contexts, when you're doing nested differentiation, uh, encounter each other and erroneously mix their values. Um, so this could lead to like silent uh, but totally wrong answers, uh, which is quite scary as a library developer. Um, and uh, since, since then, I have ha uh, implemented a tagging system. Um, to prevent this from happening. So the dual numbers that forward diff emits are tagged um, contextually based on where they came from, and uh, forward diff prevents um, dual numbers with separate tags from interacting. And so this prevents perturbation confusion from happening, and it makes our uh, nested differentiation system a bit more robust and slightly more performant. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to basically go over reverse mode AD in a theoretical sense with an example. Um, and then I'm going to kind of give my qualitative musings on um, what I learned uh, about Julia and about um, AD while implementing reverse diff um, and maybe talk about the, what I think the future is. Um, so without further ado, let's kind of start diving into reverse mode and I think the best way to do that is to actually frame the discussion um, by talking about forward mode. So uh, in forward mode, we, uh, we, we took up uh, the input, and we applied a perturbation to it. And then at each step of the computation moving forward, um, the perturbation would track derivative information with respect to the value that it was appended to. Um, so reverse mode is basically like this, except it's doing it backwards, as the name would imply. Um, so instead of uh, appending a perturbation to an input, we're essentially appending a sensitivity to an output and then propagating it backwards. And so in the uh, forward mode world, if we're, evalu if we're thinking of this from the perspective of evaluating the chain rule, um, it would be evaluating the chain rule from the innermost function to the outermost function, which is the, in the same order as the normal execution flow of your program. Uh, while in the reverse world, we are evaluating the chain rule from the outermost function to the innermost function, uh, calculating the intermediary derivatives uh, at each step. And so the main hurdle there is um, essentially having a reverse traversable computation graph in the first place. 
Um, so with forward mode, we don't have this problem because we essentially just use the runtime of whatever language we're in and um, the, the execution flow, the derivatives matches the execution flow of your program. But in reverse mode, you need some extra structure uh, and then a, a couple different frameworks provide the structure or, or get the user to provide the structure in a couple of different ways. Um, so jump has special syntax and that kind of defines this computational graph declar uh, declaratively. TensorFlow uh, does something similar, but it uses um, these objects which accumulate the graph lazily. Um, Autograd, PyTorch, and reverse diff all um, accumulate the graph dynamically by intercepting uh, operations at runtime uh, just by wrapping values in, in, in these special uh, types that will hijack control flow. Um, so the last point I should probably talk about before moving on to the example um, is addressing kind of a performance comparison between forward mode and reverse mode. So generally the, the, the kind of easy way to, to do this is to say if you're uh, differentiating a many to one function, use reverse mode. If you're differentiating a one to many function, use forward mode. And if uh, you're somewhere in between, then it's a bit trickier. Um, so why is this? So it turns out that every time you seed either a perturbation or a sensitivity to the input or the output, you require a pass over the target function to essentially propagate that seed throughout the computational graph and then accumulate derivatives with respect to that seed. Um, so in forward mode, we are uh, applying a one seed per uh, input. And so the computational cost is uh, we have to call the function um, a number of times that scales linearly with the input. In reverse mode, since we are applying these seeds to the output, um, the computational cost of evaluating uh, a full gradient is uh, constant. Um, if there's one input and if there's two, it's two, and so it scales linearly with the output. Um, there also is the notion of uh, code size as well. Uh, so in forward mode, we don't actually need to accumulate the graph, so there's no concern about storing uh, the computational graph. Uh, in reverse mode, you do need to store the computational graph. And in the traditional optimization world, if your problem is large enough, it is possible that um, you are actually uh, getting to a, re uh, a regime where um, you don't even have enough memory to store uh, the computational graph unless you're writing it out to disk. So moving to on to the example. so. Uh, I've written this pretty simple Julia function, and we're just going to th think of uh, all the variables in here as scalars. Um, and our goal will be to take the gradient of this function. So we just want to get the partial derivative with respect to x1 and respect to x2. Um, so we can kind of think about this function in its graph representation, and this can obviously be accumulated via any of the methods I talked about before. Um, and how we actually represent this graph on a computer can vary, but the thing that a lot of traditional AD people like to do is use a topologically sorted representation. So what does that mean? That basically means that we're going to have a vector of instructions where every instruction um, comes after all of its dependence instructions. So uh, we can essentially accumulate this from a graph if we have a graph in, in, in kind of this uh, node pointer form, then we can accumulate the um, topologically sorted uh, instruction list by re, uh, traversing the graph um, from its outputs back to its inputs with like a breadth first uh, traversal. And so we can essentially just accumulate the instructions and now uh, what we've essentially done is pre-computed dependencies such that a linear traversal uh, forward over this tape um, of instructions uh, will automatically uh, handle the fact, just by placement of the instructions, uh, will handle the, the, the fact that some variables may depend on other variables. And so the reverse pass does the same thing in the reverse. Um, so now you'll, you'll notice that I have, um, I've written all the primal values of the forward graph uh, as these x variables. And so we're going to introduce a new variables that are going to be our y variables, and these are going to be our adjoint variables and they'll all be uh, derivatives with respect to the output. Uh, and so um, we essentially have our chain rule for how we'll, um, how we'll define these guys and how they'll propagate uh, when we do the reverse pass. And just writing our original problem in terms of these guys, we're looking for y1 and y2 because we're looking for the partial derivatives with respect to uh, the input and output, um, or partial derivatives with respect to x1 and x2, sorry. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually assign uh, values to all of these x variables. 
and we're also going to assign values to the y variables. And so you can essentially think of this now, if, if we're talking about the actual representation on a computer, we essentially have a, a buffer for all of our primal values, a buffer for all of our adjoint derivative values, and then we have some buffer that stores the instruction pointers in the tape. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, after s setting our uh, initial x values, we're going to run the graph forward, which will accumulate all of our primal values, and then we'll run the graph backwards, which will use the primal values we accumulated to calculate all of our, uh, to calculate all of our y values. Yeah. So, um, so let's start just by saying x1 is 1 and x2 is 1, and make it easy. Um, so the first thing we do is uh, do sine of x1 equals x3. The uh, cosine of x2 is x4, and then we just multiply the two to get x5. And so at each point when we did that, um, none of these instructions had to talk to each other. All we had to do was essentially call a function and modify a buffer in place that stored our values. And so we're going to do essentially the same thing going back, I except instead of calling um, a function, the forward function, we're going to call like the reverse version of the function. And how do we actually uh, do this? So we, we start out by saying the sensitivity uh, of y5 is 1, and so that's essentially tr just trivially saying that the derivative of x5 with respect to x5 is 1. Um, and so now we're ready to actually begin our reverse pass. So uh, what we're essentially doing here is we're applying the chain rule that we wrote out earlier, um, and we're saying, okay, the output of this instruction is x5, so we want to uh, multiply y5, which we already know, uh, times the partial derivative of x3 with wi uh, partial derivative of x5 with respect to x3, which is x4, um, and then do the same thing for our other input variable, x4. So we're calculating y4 uh, and y3 because we have y x4 and x3 as our input variables. So going further up, uh, we essentially do the same thing. Uh, x2 is our input uh, variable for this instruction, and x4 is our output variable. So we want to calculate uh, y2, and we're going to use y4. Uh, we have our intermediary derivative here. Uh, we pop it into y2, and look at that. Now we already have uh, one of the partial derivatives we need. So uh, we basically do the same thing up here at the top, get our final partial derivative, uh, and we're done. So now we have the gradient. Uh, and the idea is that we, as complicated as I probably just made that seem, we just did this whole thing with a single forward pass and reverse pass of the computational graph. And this is all you would need also to, uh, to compute this if, for example, there were uh, n x's and not just two. Um, if we had more outputs, we would have to do more passes back and forth and seed each output with its um, kind of trivial sensitivity each time. So I've implemented uh, a package which does this and other people have as well. Um, my package is reverse diff um, and it uses operator overloading to collect the graph. Uh, it doesn't only support the scalar primitives that we've just seen, but it also supports array primitives, which have these linear algebraic derivative definitions um, and support most abstract array types. So uh, if, for example, you're using some specialized uh, linear algebra uh, array type, like a Hermitian matrix, um, then the derivative definitions will fall back to using the specialized operations that are defined on those types. Um, it supports what the ML people call a dynamic graph um, by re-recording. Uh, and you, the user basically chooses to re-record if they uh, kind of assert that they have value-dependent control flow in their function. Um, and then it also uh, supports um, static forward and reverse passes over a, uh, a, a static graph representation, which is our tape. It's very similar to the instruction tape we just looked at. Um, and that has several advantages. Uh, it pre-computes dispatch um, so that it doesn't incur a dynamic dispatch. Um, just uh, running through the tape. And it also contains pre-allocated instruction caches. So for example, if you need to use uh, any like temporary buffers to uh, perform a differentiation operation, it will pre-allocate those so that it just gets reused every time. Um, it also implements mixed mode AD, which um, is entitled my talk, so I at least have to mention it. Um, so with mixed mode AD, essentially what uh, reverse diff will do is if it sees a scalar subgraph, uh, which is amenable to forward mode automatic differentiation. And so in this case, that would be if the uh, input dimension is relatively low, um, then it can automatically differentiate it via forward diff. And this is quite nice because if we can differentiate it via forward diff, we actually don't even need to store the nodes uh, for those graphs. And this is really nice um, for element-wise functions uh, like map and broadcast. So what will happen 
is essentially, uh, you could, for example, take all these different broadcast operations and then not fuse them and then differentiate them one by one, or you could allow fusion to happen and then take that scalar kernel and just use dual numbers to differentiate the scalar kernel. And that's very easy to do since you have this semantic guarantee that the scalar kernel is going to be applied pointwise. Um, and so you know there's no, not gonna be any cross terms, so you can just use dual numbers very easily to get the derivatives there. Um, and so that's kind of a cool optimization that takes advantage both of loop fusion uh, and, of, and of dual numbers um, to avoid doing uh, more expensive like reverse mode work. So uh, implementing uh, reverse diff uh, taught me, I think, a lot about where I would actually like the future of AD to go in Julia, and it also exposed um, some problems with the current implementation. Um, so first of all, and this is probably not a surprise to this audience, but Julia is like really good at this stuff, actually. Um, operator overloading has no performance penalty in its first class, which is very unlike a lot of other high-level languages. Um, and it allows target code to mostly be AD unaware, so they don't have to know uh, necessarily about forward diff or reverse diff when implementing their, their functions, but uh, the function authors do have to make sure uh, that their functions are numerically type generic so I can pass in my weird intercepting uh, types. Um, also, uh, the fact that my tool for differentiating Julia code uh, is itself written in Julia means that the tool is self-differentiable, so I get nested differentiation for free, and that's pretty nice. Um, and then finally, uh, since I can support just generic array types, uh, and then other people implement uh, generic array types which are backed by specialized hardware, I can take advantage of that specialized hardware essentially for free. There's some catches there, and I have to be careful about how I write my primitive definitions, um, but it hopefully uh, can work out um, in the majority of important cases. Uh, so originally, um, one of the huge motivations for reverse diff was as a new jump backend. So jump has its own backend called reverse diff sparse, uh, which works on this specialized jump syntax uh, graph representation. Um, and it's quite fast and implements a couple of nice performance optimizations, um, but it lacks a huge number of features that reverse diff supports, and it also is, doesn't work on native Julia code. And so the kind of idea is if we could get um, a jump backend which ran on native Julia code instead of on a specialized syntax, then we'd be opening the door for a lot of interesting um, new uh, front-end kind of modeling optimization methods which w might involve like other uh, native Julia packages working on native Julia code. Um, so basically w when it came down to it we realized that reverse diff isn't yet ready to be a viable jump backend uh, mainly because it doesn't have methods yet for exploiting Hessian sparsity um, and because reverse diff sparse uh, reverse sparse tape structure is a little bit more limited, but it does have better uh, variable storage locality for scalar operations. So basically less, uh, less pointer jumps when it's doing traversal of uh, scalar calculations. Um, so later in the reverse diff development uh, cycle, uh, Mike Innes started talking to me about uh, deep learning frameworks, which I had never really looked at before. Um, and uh, I kind of just started comparing what, what, how they exposed AD to, to how I exposed AD. Um, and the thing that jumped out at me at first was uh, the fact that they exposed variable construction directly, whereas I took great pains to try to like hide that from the user, even though um, the internal utilities reverse diff uses to construct its API basically are very similar. Um, it's also the case that reverse diff doesn't have a dynamic graph representation. It's dynamic recording mechanism right straight to the static tape. And so this is totally fine for traditional optimization um, where uh, you essentially would only do dynamic recording um, in like an interactive or exploratory workflow and then in production you basically always have a static uh, graph. Um, but it's not so great for machine learning because um, they are fine with just deploying uh, code which has, uh, which does dynamic re-recording literally every iteration in production. And so that confused me for a while until I realized that uh, the optimization in deep learning worlds are in two totally different regimes graph-wise. So in the optimization world, we have many, 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 many nodes and most of them are scalar operations. So your traversal overhead is essentially like competing with the cost of uh, executing like plus on scalars. So you have to be very careful about um, about your traversal overhead, and you definitely don't want to be re-recording in the process of that. Uh, in deep learning, there are far fewer nodes, but there are very computationally expensive tensor operations. And so in their case, as long as you have something like a dynamic graph representation, 
traversal overhead is basically negligible and people are just cool with it. So I've also talked to some other folks who have expressed interest in using reverse diffs, tracing, uh, tracing mechanism and, and, and uh, graph uh, for things that aren't AD. So uh, David Sanders, who's chairing the session, works on interval constraint programming, and he needs to do similar things to propagate uh, interval constraint information, uh, not derivative information. And I think also that, this, that I if something like this existed, um, there are a host of other cool use cases for it. Um, it would require generalizing what I have in reverse diff, um, but I think this would also uh, enable better AD anyway, because there are a lot of algorithms out there uh, that require propagation of metadata that's not necessarily just raw derivative information. So the primary example is an edge pushing algorithm uh, for sparse Hessians, which relies on uh, propagating these dependency subgraphs between values. So. We've now kind of arrived at what I consider to be like the point of my talk, which is this new package that I'm working on called Cassette. Um, and this is the rallying cry for Cassette is that multiple dispatch is dead, long live multiple dispatch. It doesn't make too much sense. Maybe it'll make a little sense later, probably not, but I like it. Um, so what is Cassette? It's a native Julia execution tracer uh, and data flow package. Uh, and it allows you to essentially intercept uh, function calls of uh, raw Julia code and build a pure Julia computation graph out of that and uh, propagate values and arbitrary metadata uh, both forwards and backwards through it. Um, I have both support for a dynamic and static graph representation after kind of learning my lesson about the generality of where people actually are using AD um, and some methods to convert between them uh, such that I'm pretty sure I've designed, I've designed it such that the cost of converting between them is basically always amortized in the regime in which you actually want to use these graphs. Um, I'm stressing my, uh, my prototype of cassette uh, by implementing reverse diff on top of it. Um, and so far, that's basically led me to this nice pluggable um, dispatch-driven design where you can uh, hijack the behavior of any part of cassette's processing pipeline um, using uh, you know, normal multiple dispatch and just overloading uh, function types. And then the really, really, really big point, which I think is actually going to change the way AD works in Julia and potentially some other things as well, is that it doesn't rely on argument type propagation to intercept function calls. And so this is such an important point that I uh, have a little example about why um, it's so painful to actually, to actually rely on argument type propagation. And this is why I was saying multiple dispatch is dead because I think it's failed us by driving us to this like pattern that actually isn't very robust and doesn't work very well. Um, so, so this is kind of a, a, a pattern that I think happens a lot in Julia code for people who are doing either AD or things that are like AD, like propagating interval uh, constraint information. And this is where you define some like wrapper type um, that wraps values and uh, you then say, okay, what happens when this wrapper type gets intercepted by a function call and then you use it to like hijack dispatch. So what we're going to do is we're going to define our interceptor type, which will just be a wrapper around an array. And then we're going to say that we're gonna define primitives such that anytime we intercept a function call with our interceptor, we will wrap the function call in this intercepted and then just call it. And then all that we'll do just for the sake of example is do something like print that it was called and then call the original function. Okay, so just to define some primitives on this guy, um, I'm just going to use this example, uh, base.f. Um, and for one argument, uh, defining the primitive for base.f is fine. Uh, it's very easy and nice. For two, it gets a little bit less nice. We now have to define something on the order of 50 methods. Of course, this depends on how you subtyped interceptor, but we subtyped it to abstract array. Um, so what I've done is I've basically uh, loop through all the potential types that this interceptor could be ambiguous with um, and then define the, uh, the, the binary method on those types. And so if we do something like a three argument primitive, we get up to 2,000 methods. And if we do a four argument primitive, we get to like 100,000 methods. And this is just gross. Um, and it's not only just gross, it's like also totally unrobust. As soon as somebody comes in with a new package that's unaware of your code and defines their own uh, subtype of abstract array, you'll have ambiguities um, just floating everywhere in your code awaiting for users to discover them. And so this is why I'm saying like multiple dispatch is dead. Like why did it lead us down this horrible path? Like I feel betrayed. But also long live multiple dispatch because it's going to, it's going to give us the, shuttle, uh, the shovel with which we can dig ourselves out of the hole that it put us in. So 
essentially what I have here is this is this mockup. I have actual code that does this, um, but for the sake of the slide, this is just a mockup where I have uh, this function which uh, can give me the code info given a type signature, and then it will. Uh, just walk through the code, and every time it sees a call, it'll wrap it with this intercepted uh, type that we had before. And then I have a, another function wrapper, which when called, essentially generates a method body from this code info function. Okay, so maybe that's a little bit abstract. What it looks like in reality is if we have some function f, and then I wrap it in a trace, the function that it will, uh, the actual method body it will generate will look something like this. It'll just wrap every function call in this intercepted type. This is actually wonderful um, because what it means is we don't need for target function to be type generic anymore. Uh, we don't need to define a crazy number of methods per, per uh, primitive we want to support. Uh, we don't even need to define new number or array types if all we're doing is propagating meta data or hijacking execution flow because um, we don't need to try to swing ourselves into weird corners just to, uh, just to drive, drive dispatch. Um, in the future, uh, since we have access to the whole code lowered, we could um, wrap SSA uh, form control flow instructions like uh, the go to and less stuff that you would see if you uh, looked at uh, a for loop in SSA form after it went through code lowered. Um, and so that would be great because it would kind of give us the best of both the static and dynamic worlds because you'd essentially have your dynamic graph being defined statically, which is exactly what happens if you write normal Julia code or normal code in a language usually. Um, so the future, um, I obviously need to finish and document and test and release consent, uh, and that's going to be targeting Julia 0.7, mainly because I had to make a four line change to base, which allowed me to emit code info from generated functions. Um, and that, there's no way that would be backported. Uh, <laughs> so uh, got to wait for 0.7. Um, and then the plan is to replace both forward diff and reverse diff with new cassette based packages, um, which should basically resolve almost all of my problems with, with both forward diff and reverse diff, um, and a lot of user problems too, where the code isn't type generic, so you can't differentiate it. Um, eventually, I'd like to replace reverse diff sparse just by implementing those optimizations that I talked about earlier. Um, and then after that, I guess I would evangelize cassette for the other regimes that I mentioned, um, and then possibly maybe have e uh, even uh, shoot for native language support for this kind of thing, um, so I know that uh, Tim Bassard uh, a while ago opened up a PR to add type inference hooks, which basically did something that was equivalent to this, but in a way that was, you know, natively supported and so probably a bit more robust. Um, and I think eventually that kind of thing will be a very powerful abstraction to expose, maybe not to users, but at least to downstream library authors for doing the kind of things that I would like to do with Cassette. Um, so finally, I'd just like to thank all of these people. Um, especially Cosmin Petra, uh, who is funding me for the summer. He's really interested in seeing AD and Julia improve. Um, so with, oh, I'd also like to thank Jameson Nash because we accidentally took the same flight here. And so I trapped him for six hours on a plane and just <laughs> used him as my rubber ducky. Um, and also had him try to convince him that returning a code in for, from a generated function was safe. And he was convinced, maybe, I don't know. He's not here. I don't know why I'm looking over there. Anyway, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>